Welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. This afternoon, May 8th, 2023, we are discussing American trade law in a post-WTO appellate body world. My name is Jack Capizzi, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions are of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions that you might have. If you have a question at any time during today's program, please type it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle the questions as we can towards the end of today's program. With that, allow me to introduce our moderator, Trevor Jones. Trevor is a law student at Harvard Law School. Additionally, he is a student liaison for the Federalist Society's International and National Security Law Practice Group Executive Committee. With that, thank you all for being with us. Trevor, over to you. Thanks, Jack. And uh, welcome to everyone joining us here today. Uh, I think we're going to have an exciting panel to talk about a very pressing issue, uh, the WTO appellate body, its status, and how its lack of functioning impacts American trade law. And we've got two great panelists with us today. I'm going to give them a brief introduction, then I'm going to go into about 30, 40 minutes of uh, directed Q&A. But if at any time, as Jack said, please drop a question into the Q&A box below. And if it lines up with the questions I'm asking, I'll ask it. Otherwise, I'll ask it at the end. Um, so with that, our two panelists today are David Ross and Jameson Greer. David is a partner at Wilmer Hales International Trade Group, and prior to that, he worked at USTR litigating cases before the WTO appellate body and was a staffer on the Senate Finance Committee, which oversees U.S. trade law. And uh, Jameson is a partner at King & Spaulding in their international trade group. And prior to that, he was the chief of staff for Ambassador Robert Lighthizer at uh, USTR from 2017 to 2020, I believe. So uh, with that, I'm going to open it up for some questions. And uh, David, to get us started, I, as I mentioned, you used to litigate in front of the WTO appellate body. And I was wondering if you could give those in the audience who don't really know how the appellate body functions a brief overview of how the dispute resolution process works at the WTO or used to work. Uh, sure. Thanks, Trevor. So, so just, I guess, to step back to the, to the beginning of a, of a case uh, under the WTO, uh, if a country has, a, has an issue with another country's measure under one of the trade agreements, they can request consultations. Uh, if the consultations don't request, don't, don't resolve the issue, which they often don't, then the complainant can, can ask for a panel. Uh, panels are, are uh, created. Typically, three trade experts will hear the case. It's a briefing, oral argument, responses to questions and whatnot. Uh, at which point, then the panel will issue findings on whatever the legal issues are uh, in that dispute. Uh, the, the losing party then has the right to appeal uh, the, the, the adverse findings uh, to the appellate body, uh, which, which often would happen. Uh, whereas panels are, are ad hoc uh, trade experts, the appellate body was a standing set of appellate body members. Uh, and you would, hear, you would hear the case in front of typically three appellate body members. Uh, it's really akin to, as you would expect, uh, appellate advocacy. There's no discovery, discovery or anything like that. Uh, the the uh, proceeding is is supposed to be limited just to legal findings, although uh, the appellate body sometimes strayed from that. Uh, and then the appellate body would issue its decision, which then uh, the the losing party could decide whether or not to implement. So that's that's basically how it happened. Uh, but but um, again, briefing oral argument, decision, and then decision what to do. Muted myself. Uh, in your experience litigating and before them, how did, you, how did you find them? How did you find their interpretation of the treaties? Maybe talk about some of the cases you brought and your opinions of the appellate body from those cases. Uh, sure. Well, so early on, I think the appellate body, they were really quite strong and, and they, they had some of the early opinions were, were um, pretty well reasoned. They were relatively short uh, to the point they did, they did focus just on the, on the legal issues, which is what they're supposed to do under the terms of the dispute settlement understanding. Uh, over time, that, that changed. I think that the appellate body started to have a more expansive view of, of their role and maybe start to stray into some things that they that they shouldn't have, at least in the views of the United States and some other some other countries. So so um, I mean I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but but for example, uh, and James could talk about this, USTR put out a report 
during the Trump administration talking about the ways in which the appellate body had, had in the U.S. view exceeded the terms of their mandate. And they had uh, case studies that, that spanned really about 20 years. And, and some of the things that the report highlighted uh, were things that, that related to my cases, which, which had taken place in the early 2000s. So, so the issues that, that we had seen early on continued and kind of multiplied over, over, the, over the years. So just to give one very small concrete example, and then I could go into more detail if, if you wanted to. Uh, I litigated the, the US safeguard uh, on, on LAM, uh, which was a case that, that we had put a, a safeguard measure in under section 201 uh, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the trade law and, and Australia and New Zealand uh, challenged, challenged uh, that, that determination. And you know, it's interesting, I had started my career at the Commerce Department. I'd litigated there for four years uh, before US courts. I'd then gone to the private sector for a couple of years and I'd never lost an issue in, in my first six years of practice. And then when we got to the WTO in the LAM case, I lost every single issue, uh, both at the panel level and at the appellate body. It was, I would have been better off uh, if I hadn't even put a brief in almost. But, but um, just to give one example, there was this issue where they, they determined, the appellate body determined uh, that the U.S. had had fallen short uh, because we hadn't made uh, a finding of unforeseen developments, and that was something that we didn't think was required. But to take a step further, not only did they say that we had to uh, have made a finding of unforeseen developments, they said we had to make that finding in a written report that we were re required to publish at the time of the safeguard. Now, I challenge you uh, to look through the WTO safeguards agreement and find anything in there that says that you have to have a written report setting out your findings uh, at the time you put the safeguard in, in place. That's just contrary, uh, in our view, to the way that the, that the um, process is supposed to work. But nonetheless, uh, they said that, that was required. That's just a very teeny example, but there were many more uh, examples that we could go into if you wanted us to. Yeah, perfect. No, that's great. I just thought, you know, good to lay out a good example of some of the kind of case law that was coming out of the appellate body. And I, the Jameson, as David mentioned, you, you obviously, you helped write that report at USTR or oversaw it. And prior to even being at USTR, you were active in the trade law world. So what's your, what was your perspective on the appellate body coming into the Trump administration? Sure, ha happy, happy to discuss that. So, so prior to going into the administration, uh, you know, like David, litigated trade, trade cases. Uh, in my case, I was at Skadden and I was doing a lot of trade remedy litigation. You may have heard of anti-dumping countervailing duty cases. That, that's what this is, right? That these are cases where if you're a U.S. domestic producer, you're going to the appropriate U.S. agencies, Commerce Department, the International Trade Commission, and you're alleging that you know, foreign producers of a product, whether it's steel, aluminum, or some consumer good, whatever, you know, agricultural good, whatever it might be, uh, that it's being sold in the United States uh, uh, below, at less than fair value, or that it's being subsidized. Um, and sometimes less than fair value, it can mean being sold uh, below its cost of production. Okay. And so in that situation, the Commerce Department will, will measure, it will quantify the amount of, of dumping or subsidization and essentially assign a tariff rate to that, right? If you're dumping by 20%, 20% remedial tariff rate to level out the market because there's been a, a distortion in the market. And then on the other hand, you're proceeding before the International Trade Commission to show that the domestic industry has actually been injured um, because if there's no injury from the unfair trade, then the law doesn't, doesn't permit any kind of action, right? So you have to show that there's unfair trade and that there's injury. And in that case, you can get an order where there will be you know, that remedial tariff placed on imports of those goods from those countries. And it can be very specific to certain producers and that kind of thing. Um, and so that was the kind of law that I was engaged in. And you know, I'm talking about that because many of the WTO cases affected these trade remedy laws. That, that's not all. It affected our tax laws. It affected you know, safeguards like David was talking about. It affected a lot of things. Um, but it did have a big effect on our anti-dumping countervailing duty laws. Uh, and so that was my perspective coming into the administration. I mean, one of the big things, and again, I'll just give an example, is that the WTO, it took upon itself through a series of, of findings by the appellate body to essentially outlaw uh, a methodology, a calculation methodology called zeroing. Um, I won't go too far into the details. Uh, David is probably thinking, Jameson, don't, don't do this. Don't subject everyone to this. Um, but, but in short, um, when commerce is finding a dumping margin, 
um, they just, you know, historically, they would just issue a margin that assessed the amount of dumping that was going on. Uh, opponents to dumping and other countries came and they said, well, you actually need to, you Commerce Department, you have to offset all of this dumping with all of the good sales that we're making. So we understand we robbed your grocery store, but sometimes we came and we paid you for those groceries. So, you know, it's all, it's all a wash, right? Um, and so, I mean, it, it seems silly, right, to excuse bad behavior with, you know, occasional good behavior. And, and in fact, the WTO agreements did not include this. Part of the reason why the United States was willing to agree to the WTO agreements was because they, um, they, they purportedly, at least according to you know, U.S. negotiators, actually accounted for U.S. anti-dumping countervailing duty law, largely in the same state in which it was, uh, in which it was at the time. Um, and so it was very jarring uh, for U.S. industry to find out, you know, several years later that actually this methodology that had been going on for years and presumably had been incorporated into the WTO agreements was now being overruled by the appellate body, um, which, of course, results in less protection for domestic industries that are suffering um, from unfairly traded imports, not just imports generally, but unfairly traded ones. Uh, and so this was kind of the context for me going into the administration. Perfect. And, and could you maybe explain for the audience the exact mechanism by which the Trump administration paralyzed the appellate body, what, what they did to do that and how that impacted the process that David sure. laid out in the beginning? Yeah, no, I, I'm happy to, happy to do that. Um, so the appellate body is full of members, right? It has uh, seven members. It's a standing body. And those members have terms that expire and they're replaced uh, through consensus at the World Trade Organization. That's how it operates. And so everyone has to agree to start the process for replacing a member, and then they all have to agree to the member. Now, before the Trump administration ever got into office, the Obama administration actually refused to, uh, to seat a member. Um, they, they refused to uh, you know, join the consensus uh, on, a, on a certain member of the appellate body. Um, so it wasn't the first time that it had been done. However, when when the administration came in, uh, as as David noted, you know we had a huge amount of problems with the WTO. You know he and I have kind of been talking about specific cases and bad rulings and that kind of and there were there were plenty of those to go around, right? But on top of that, there were other issues. Um, and you can actually go on US Charge website and you can see starting in 2017 all the way through the end a series of public statements, uh, not just the report David referenced, but public statements pointing out all the ways that the appellate body had gone, you know, way far off course compared to what was agreed in the WTO agreements, whether it included, you know, the, the length of reports, you know, exceeding the 90 day limit uh, on the timing of it, uh, reaching issues of fact, reviewing issues of fact that they're not allowed to, uh, making advisory opinions on issues that are outside the terms of reference of the dispute. And then issues with the members themselves. I mean, there was a member uh, from China who, you know, up until we pointed it out, showed on her bio that she was part of a think tank that was run by the Chinese government. You're not supposed to be affiliated with the government of the country where you are, that you're representing. Uh, there were issues about compensation and, you know, the per diem and all these, you know, budgetary issues. So there were just a variety of issues. And over the course of, of our time there, we put out a lot of papers on this. Yeah, well, I guess, David, you're you're in the private sector when the appellate body kind of goes dark, so to speak. I think that was December 2019 when they no longer had a quorum to uh, start appellate panels anymore. How, how did you see that impacting private practice in the trade field in D.C. and clients? The, the, the principal impact that we've seen uh, in the private sector and for clients is that there just aren't very many cases being filed anymore. Uh, I think there's a perception that that you can't uh, push that case through the WTO anymore because uh, if you win at the panel stage, the losing party appeals to the appellate body. There's no appellate body to hear it, and so you're effectively what they call appealing into the void, and the the case goes off, can't get formally decided, and so the winning party uh, can't then get a final decision. Uh, and then if the if the losing party refuses to implement the winning party can't get WTO authorization to impose countermeasures. So there's just a kind of paralysis, or at least a perception of paralysis. Um, and, and between that, and I think other, and Jameson actually could maybe talk to this, uh, there's just been 
a real slowdown, at least in the United States, filing cases at all. Uh, I don't know if it's solely because of WTO or not, but I don't think the U.S. has filed an offensive case since 2017 or 18. And so there's just not much litigation going on. And so people are looking elsewhere uh, uh, for, for, for instruments to challenge uh, unfair foreign trade practices. Section 301 of the Trade Act of 74 being an example, another area that Jameson can talk to because it was really the Lighthizer uh, uh, USTR that brought that tool back uh, into use. And so you're seeing that, you're seeing more just ADCBD, uh, but just a real slowdown in WTO litigation worldwide. Yeah, I guess, Jameson, to, to follow up on that, I guess, you know, now that we're not, there's no functioning appellate body, so we're not bringing disputes there. When a trade partner does something that violates a trade agreement, what are the options available to the president, to the U.S. trade representative to take action, if not to go to the WTO? Sure. And, and I'm also realizing I didn't really squarely answer your last question to me, which is I talked about the problems, but we, we stopped appointing we stopped agreeing to appoint appellate body members just to be absolutely clear for the audience. We, you know, Obama started it, we continued it, and the Biden administration has continued it. Um, it's been supported by, you know, you know, Senator Wyden and Senator Crapo and Senator Grassley before Senator Crapo. Um, so this is something that's widely recognized uh, as an issue. Um, and so, so what do you do, right? What do you do in the absence of the WTO? I think it is important as well to, to level set about you know, what happened before, right? When we would say, oh, well, before there was enforcement, we could go to the WTO. You know, to David's point, you know, it may be that early on things were more effective, but I mean, when we were at USTR, we were still dealing with disputes that were 10, 12, 13, 14 years old without resolution, Boeing Airbus, beef hormones, and notably those are with the EU who's supposed to be right simpatico with uh, international trade rules. We had issues with China on films and the films we could have in the market. I mean, just, so, so when we say there was really good enforcement with beforehand with the WTO, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that proposition. And so the idea that, oh, well, what do we do now? The question kind of presumes that before it was like a really effective thing, right? When in reality, it couldn't capture a lot of Chinese non-market activities. Anyway, so in the absence of, you know, a demonstrated ability of the WTO to not be very effective with respect to U.S. policy, um, what do you do in its absence? Uh, Section 301 is something David referred to. It's uh, Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974. Uh, it gives the president authority, it's been delegated to USTR, to investigate unfair or discriminatory trade practices uh, that burden U.S. business, U.S. commerce unreasonably. Uh, and coming out of that investigation, uh, if we find violations that there are trade practices by foreign governments who have policies and practices that you know meet those standards, uh, then there are two things you can do. If you have a policy or practice that falls underneath um, a trade agreement that has a dispute settlement procedure, you have to go that way. The, the legislation as revised requires you to go that way. If there are policies and practices that aren't captured under a trade agreement with a dispute settlement system, then you can do other things. And it gives pretty broad remit uh, to the administration, to the president, to be able to impose tariffs, impose quotas, assess fees on services, otherwise restrict market access. And so when we did the section, you know, we, we alleged, we did an investigation under 301 in the Trump administration. We found that China had been engaged in, a, in policies and procedures on forced technology transfer for many years. Uh, we found a harm, very conservative harm of $50 billion annually. Um, the harms that we found, there were a variety of different ways of, of forced tech transfer. One, one of these having to do with discriminatory licensing fell underneath the TRIPS agreement, which is the WTO um, agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property. And so we brought a case uh, with respect to that. But with respect to a lot of the other things that were going on, you know, cyber hacking, you know, you know trade secret theft, other types of things, um, that, that was not actionable under TRIPS. And so we went with domestic U.S. authority under Section 301 to impose tariffs. And then there are other things that can be done. You know, David referred to, to you know, Section 201, um, which has always been something, right? And I don't think counter duty laws, that's always been there. Those are things that are, you know, nominally authorized by the WTO, you know, despite their, um, their, their adverse rulings against some of those things. We have Section 232, which is a national security-based uh, tool. It's not really a trade tool. It's national security, but has big trade effects. So there are certainly other things that the president can do to enforce, um, you know, trade laws with respect to other countries, even without the WTO. 
Yeah. So I guess, you know, here's an interesting question. You know, I know part of USMCA, which you were on the team helping to negotiate, had a dispute resolution process. Could you maybe talk about how that was different from the WTO appellate body? Because I have to imagine you guys having seen how badly the dispute resolution process and the appellate body went, designed something that you thought might be workable. And could you maybe explain what that is and how that operates? Sure. Well, you know, the, the old NAFTA, it had a dispute settlement process too. However, it also made it very easy for one party to block the formation of a panel. And so that dispute settlement procedure under the old NAFTA became a dead letter. Okay. Um, in fact, what ended up happening is after a couple of cases that became very political and everyone blocked the panels, the parties just stopped using NAFTA dispute settlement and they would just take those disputes to the WTO instead. So we did one. So, so with USMCA, uh, we made that practice. Uh, we, we made that practice impossible, right? You can't you can't block a panel anymore. So the panels proceed. And we've had, you know, and, and to David's point, there hasn't been a lot of WTO cases from the US, but there have been um, USMCA cases uh, from all sides, right? Um, and they were designed to move quickly. Um, they're designed to move rapidly. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of traditional dispute settlement aspects related to it. I think ultimately, my own view is very realist is that if you have some trade, if you have some policy or practice in your home country and it's a cent and you believe it's essential to your, you know, to, to your economic well being or whatever you want to call it, you know, you, you may not comply with that ruling. I mean, ideally you comply most of the time. And then if there's something that becomes an issue, you want to negotiate a resolution. I, th I think maybe what I would say, you know, what's the difference with USMCA versus WTO is we really wanted to drive negotiated solutions and provided lots of opportunities for consultations uh, and that kind of thing, which of course exists in other contexts too. But the, the ideal resolution for trade disputes is a negotiated outcome and not litigation, trying to get some outcome that was never agreed to in, in the original um, agreement. Yeah. And I guess, you know, for David or Jameson, either of you, uh, have you guys, if you've been following the European alternative, I believe MPIA, how have you, how is that developing as an alternative to the appellate body? How is it different? And is it a viable alternative? Sure. Uh, happy to hear David's thoughts on this too. So, so the MPIA as an alternative, it's, it's like a coalition of the willing, right? It, it's folks, um, WTO members who really love the appellate body and want to have an appellate level of review uh, for a variety of reasons. And, and just to like step back, you know, what one step, you know, another reason why in the Trump administration, we weren't huge fans of the appellate body is just kind of structural. It's like, if you're the largest player on the block and you're trying to, you know, pursue what you believe is in your national interest through your economic policies that have been established by a democratic Congress, why should that be subject to, you know, some appellate bodies, you know, over, you know, overreaching rulings. Like, why should that even be the case? Now, if you're on the other side and you're like, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a smaller country or you're, you're Peru or you're, you know, you're New Zealand or somebody like that, you want to be able to bell the cat. And who's the cat? It's not just China. It's not just the EU. It's the United States, right? Um, anyway, and so a lot of these countries said, well, we really want to have an appellate body or some level of review because it gives us a second bite at the apple. And that kind of thing. And you know what? That's fine. If other countries want to do that and agree with each other to do it, that's fine. There, there's been a, I think there's been a case come out, a farmer related issue between, I think, Turkey and the EU. You can correct me, David, if I'm wrong. Um, and okay, if they want to do that and have that second layer of review, they feel like that gives them some resolution they can do that. And to me, that's, that's great, right? Rather than, you know, if they want to proceed on those lines and have that extra review, that's their sovereign right to do it. I won't complain about that, you know, whether it makes sense for us to do it. I don't think it makes sense, right? If we want to have an extra layer of review, we just start, you know, staffing up the appellate body again. I guess I would just um, add to that. First of all, yeah, for, for those who, who are willing to embrace that system, it's all consensual. Uh, and I'm sure it'll, it'll work just fine for them. Um, the WTO as a whole, the rules are, are consent-based. I mean, no, there's, there's no WTO army, they can't force you to do anything. And so as long as, as uh, countries are willing to accept the findings, then, then they should go ahead and, and use the system. I, sh I should say that, that for my own, my own uh, position, I actually believe in the WTO dispute settlement system. I, I uh, generally had good experiences before the panels. Uh, as I said, I thought the appellate body in the early years was a constructive force and, and 
uh, basically helped. At the end of the day, what is it? It's really just like mediating disagreements between between countries. At the end of which, there's some agreed findings that you can decide whether or, or whether or not to to adhere to. Um, it's a way of resolving those those disputes. But but where they where they lose track again is when they start creating obligations. And so just to circle back to something that Jamison was agreeing to to early or talking about earlier, the whole issue of zeroing. Um, you know, Jamison represents domestic companies. He hated zeroing. I was at USTR defending zeroing. So of course I hated the findings on zeroing. If you had somebody here today who, who defended foreign companies primarily in ADCPD cases, they would say zeroing is, a, is an abomination. You know, it's terrible and it's distortive and, and it's totally wrong. But but they would be but, wrong. They would, they well, would be well, wrong. well, well, whether they're wrong or whether they're right or wrong. The, the, no, the, no, the, key, the, the, the key point is that, that the basic understanding in, in the WTO agreements is that is that when when countries agree to rules, uh, they're agreeing to live, limit their sovereignty in certain respects with respect to the issues that are addressed in those agreements. But if the issues aren't addressed in the agreements, then they have not consented to be bound by rules and they've retained their, their right to do whatever they want. And and Zeroing, like like a, a written report of RPC developments, you can read the AD agreement from start to finish, and you're not going to find any discussion of zeroing. And and nor would you, because some of the primary negotiators of the WTO AD agreement were the United States and the EU, both of which use zeroing. And so the idea that they would have uh, uh, gotten rid of zeroing was unlikely to start with, but, but the idea that they would have gotten rid of it without saying so in agreement is just ridiculous. And, and so in zeroing, like I think many issues we saw with the appellate body, the perception that we had was that the appellate body had a very negative view of trade remedy laws, the AD agreement, the, the, the uh, countervailing duty law, the safeguard law. They had a place that they wanted to get to, and then they looked for some hook in the agreement that they could find to anchor uh, an argument for why that thing wasn't allowed, and then they work backwards. And and zeroing is an example of that. There, there's a, a line in the text that says you shall make a fair comparison. And and the appellate body said, voila, fair comparison, zeroing is not fair, and therefore it's not allowed. Um, quite a surprise to the negotiators, uh, including one of the early zeroing decisions. There was a dissent by by a panelist. Uh, the panelist wasn't identified, but we all knew. That it was one of the uh, it was the EU panelists, the EU national panelist, who had been one of the negotiators of the AD agreement because he worked for the EU uh, uh, and a dumping authority, and they got the commission, and and he knew <laughs> that, that there wasn't any uh, interest in getting rid of zeroing, and he knew that, that wasn't what that provision was meant to do. But but uh, you know he was overruled uh, by by the secretary and by the appellate body, and 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 there you are. And, and we said at the time. In our in our statements to the dispute settlement body, that this kind of thing is corrosive, because because it is creating obligations that countries didn't agree to, and if it continues, you're going to see a, a collapse in support uh, among those governments who are on the losing side for the appellate body, and that's just what happened. And 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 as, as Jameson said, they had a lot of concerns in 2017, but the concerns went all the way back to when I was there. And you you could ask any USTR lawyer over the last 20 years who's litigated in Geneva. And they'll all say the same thing because we saw it again and again and again. Yeah, no, thank you. And, you know, I guess, you know, kind of turning towards the moving forward kind of phase of my questions, it, it seems like in the years since we've blocked the appellate body nominations, we've kind of doubled down on policies that if there was a functioning appellate body would be struck down, you know, to the extent the appellate body was clearly constricting American law on stuff like taxes, as Jameson mentioned, on trade policy with things like zeroing, which I guess not law, but regulatory practice, but also things like the Byrd Amendment. You know, American law was very much constricted by the rulings of the appellate body. But now without them, it seems like with things like the IRA's clean energy tax credits, which seem to be a pretty clear violation of uh, national treatment principles in the WTO treaty, the CHIPS Act, which is certainly an actionable subsidy under the SCM agreement. All of these things kind of point towards, you know, if we were to even reset up an appellate body, it seems like, you know, am I right in saying that the U.S. government would not agree most likely to restarting the appellate body without a wholesale rewriting of a lot of provisions of the WTO treaty? Or do you think there's a world where it comes back without actually addressing the underlying treaty problems? Well, that's that's the question, right? Um, a lot of this depends on, it's kind of a multi-layered question, right? Because you have some folks who at this point 
will concede, you know, maybe have been wholehearted supporters of the WTO system, wholehearted supporters of the DSU, speed up understanding, wholehearted supporters of the appellate body. But even they have come to say something like, well, I agree that we should make sure that the appellate body should be, you know, hitting its deadlines and they should stay within the, you know, confines of the terms of reference of the dispute. Um, and people shouldn't stay over their terms, which they did for years. Um, you know, you can find people like that, but ultimately, um, those, those, a lot of those folks would, you know, disagree and you can go look on the internet right now, there are, you know, dozens of articles out there saying the IRA is terrible, you know, violates all these things, you know, buy America rules are terrible, et cetera. So, I mean, I kind of, it depends, it depends where you sit. Right. Um, so, so for me, I mean, I'll just be really candid. Like I think a lot of the WTO, uh, rules, um, maybe are not helpful to the United States. And, and the fact that so many countries always want an excuse or to get out of the rules kind of suggests that maybe, you know, m- maybe there's value in being more, more pragmatic, right? I mean, I think if you have a, like a super libertarian view of trade where you think that all, you know, any kind of, you know, protection of a domestic industry should be removed and like is a moral evil, then of course you're going to like want the, the, the appellate body to come back, come back and force and be really strong. Um, you know, if you're someone like me, who's, who's, you know, toward the other end of the spectrum, you would think, well, I don't, I don't want appellate body. First of all, cause I, you know, some of the rules I think are not helpful and the appellate body itself is damaging. That being said, I, I do think there's a role for dispute settlement. Um, again, a negotiated answer is the best. Um, you know, a, a dispute settlement panel that's non-binding can come down and give a lot of you know helpful guidance to countries and also give some rhetorical weight uh, to the opponents of, of the measure. Um, you know, if an appellate body were to come back and they said, well, it's just going to be advisory too, then maybe that's something, you know, I, I could get on board with. Um, you know, but, you know, I, I think there would, it, it's hard to imagine a situation I don't, I don't know if the other countries would be willing to negotiate certain changes to the WTO agreements in order to get an appellate body. I mean, I just don't think that they would do that. I mean, the EU really wants an appellate body. They just, you know, they're very bureaucratic and they love this stuff. I remember when I was um, in the administration, I had a meeting once with, uh, you know, my counterpart in the European Union. And, you know, when you go to these meetings, everyone has like a list of things they're going to touch on. And, you know, on my list was, or no, it wasn't my list, on her list was, I, I want these guys to get started appointing appellate body members again. And so she like, you know, gave me her spiel. And I said, well, you know, I, you have to admit that these members are not following the rules that the member, you know, the appellate body members are not following the rules that the WTO members set out for them, whether it was overstaying their terms you know, issuing rulings late, you know, going beyond their authority and making rulings, doing advisory opinions on things that weren't even raised. I kind of went through these points and, you know, her response, and and I said, don't you think that's non-democratic? And she kind of shrugged and said, well, I mean, that's, that's the system that's developed and we should support it. Right. It was like, this is crazy. Like we're, you know, whether you're a Democrat or Republican in the United States, we're all like, you know, small D Democrats. Small D Republicans, and, and we should and we should want you know people in positions of power to be held accountable. Um, and so I, I just think that can you get to a spot where we're tying you know staffing up the appellate body to renegotiating commitments in the World Trade Organization that allow for more protectionism? I mean, I guess conceptually that could happen, but I think in reality it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, I guess, you know, what I was trying to get at with the question was more of like, is there a world where either party in, in the in the United States, Republican Party, which cares about stuff like chips, the Chips Act, or I would say a bulk of it, and then 232 tariffs, which were also recently ruled by a dispute panel to be in violation of the WTO, and then the Democratic Party, which cares a lot about the IRA and its clean energy provisions. Is there a world where either of them would get behind restarting up an appellate body that would certainly start ruling these things illegal. I, I mean, and I'll let David comment too, because I'm like talking a bunch, but I, to me, it's almost less about party and more about like, I don't want to say class, but kind of, you know, wh- wh- where you are in each party, because like on the democratic side, I mean, I'm sure there are people right now in the white house who, if you said, Hey, let's restart the appellate body. It'll make the Europeans really happy. They would just drop everything and say, Oh yeah, let, let's do it. Whatever the Europeans ask, we'll do it. 
Um, but, you know, thankfully we have a USTR that's kind of more level-headed about it. Same time on the Republican Party, I think you have a lot of folks who are supportive of, you know, big business. They want to make sure that that folks are, are you know, able to export and, you know, rightly so, want to take care of trade, you know, trade barriers in other countries like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But then you have folks who maybe, you know, maybe they're more populist or they're in a, you know, kind of, you know, rust belt, you know, poor industrial area where they would say, listen, I, I'm a Republican, but no way do I want a world trade organization continuing to restrict U.S. government policy. If we need to do a subsidy, if we need to protect, if we need to do tariffs, we have to do it. Otherwise, we're going to lose all these middle class jobs that, you know, that are critical to kind of the fabric of our society and our defense industrial base. So, so it's not, I don't think it's an R&D thing. I think it's who, who in each party is going to be running trade policy because in each party, you'll have proponents either way. I, I, I would say that just in terms of the United States, as Jameson said, yes, there, there are, there are uh, uh, parts of the, of, of the U.S. political system who would support bringing the, w, the WTO back, the public body back. Uh, I think the, the, the USTR prior to Messer Lighthizer probably would have supported finding a way to do that. Um, but the bigger point, I think, as Jameson says, is just whether that's politically realistic is not the question. And, and really, principally because at the end of the day, WTO rules are adopted by consensus. And so all WTO members have to agree to changes to the rules. Uh, and, and I would suspect that any changes that the US would wanna make, for example, to get more directly at what China's been doing, China wouldn't agree to. Uh, any changes to the national security provisions to address some of the United States uh, has, has been doing in recent years, other countries aren't going to want to do. And so that's going to be the real challenge. I mean, unless they come up with some kind of least common denominator set of, of things that would allow it to get going again, uh, I, I think it's unlikely. And it just seems to me hard, hard to get there. Yeah, well, no, thank you both. I'm going to start turning to the Q&A for the audience. So if you have any questions, please, please drop them in. Um, we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, one on MPIA, which I, I we, we got into in terms of but I guess the second part of the question is, is there a viable long-term solution or replacement for the appellate body? So, I mean, well, one, one thing that I've been arguing uh, to, to our colleagues at USTR uh, is, is that you don't really need the appellate body uh, to use WTO rules. Um, if you look at if you look at the statute, as Jameson said, under the, under the Section 301 statute, for example, uh, it says that if uh, there is an issue that is uh, inconsistent with a trade agreement, you have to go uh, to the WTO and, and litigate the issue. Uh, it, it definitely says that, but, but it doesn't say you have to litigate it all the way through the appellate body before you can then uh, take action against the other country if they don't implement uh, any any, any um, uh findings against them. So, so in my view, you could go, USTR could take an issue to the WTO, have a panel review the issue, uh, have the panel issue its findings. And then at that point, if, if the US wins the case, tell the other country, you need to come into compliance or we're going to use section 301 to put trade sanctions in place and then negotiate the issue out that way. So the same process, but just without the appellate body stage, I think that is legal uh, under under existing law and and could be done. Uh, it's not something that USTR has done thus far, but I, I could see that, which would which would be more similar to what the system was uh, back under the under the old gas system, uh, where it requires at the end of the day voluntary uh, uh, compliance. But but it could be done. Now the the if if you did take that step and put sanctions in place, they're not going to be WTO authorized countermeasures, and so this can be WTO illegal in a sense. Uh, but but again. You know, WTO dispute someone at the end of the day is more about a means to to come to a mutually satisfactory outcome. Uh, tariffs aren't the aren't the objective normally. Yeah, and I I, I agree with that, and I think that you know David's thought is, is intriguing. Um, you know, kind of a bit behind all of this and all of this discussion is where, where's the political will, right? I mean, we we talked earlier about well. We're not doing WTO cases now. What do you do in the absence of that? To, to me, that's a similar question as to what do we what do we do going forward? I mean, in some senses, you know, it, it matters less the vehicle in which we do it and more the fact that we do it. So, like in the Trump administration, you know, we we used 
WTO, uh, we brought WTO cases, not, not very many, again, because we didn't think they were timely or, or super effective or even that we'd necessarily get a fair, fair hearing. Um, but we used some, but we relied heavily, as we discussed, on these domestic enforcement measures. You know, now we're in a situation where WTO cases aren't being brought and there's not a lot of enforcement otherwise. Okay. So, I mean, the administration could still be using Section 301 for, for other measures or practices and different things like that, uh, but they're not, right? And, and listen, it's easy for me to sit here and, and you know, play, you know, armchair quarterback. Doing policy is, is hard work. It's, it's not as easy as it looks um, from, from the outside. Um, but going forward, I mean, there has to be a desire to enforce, right? If you want to enforce, there are domestic laws on the books where you, you can enforce. Um, you know, the discussion of whether, you know, we're going to have a WTO appellate body, it's almost less about the United States' ability to get what it wants in the international arena and more about should we have, should we get together with other countries and give another college try to make everyone become more market oriented, or are we going to take the last 25 years of data and evidence and say, well, that was a good experiment. It worked in some ways. Maybe we should try something different or, or try something else. I mean, I think from a U.S. perspective, if you want to further U.S. national interests, we have U.S. laws on the books that we can use. If we can do it in coordination with our allies, good. If we can do it in a way that is, you know, compliant with international, you know, norms, good. Um, but I mean, there just has to be a political willingness underlying all of it, um, you know, go going going forward. And Trevor, one thing that I would add to what you said earlier, um, if, if the rules had to be changed uh, to such an extent that, for example, the EV tax credit would be seen as okay, um, you may as well not have the system because that is flatly, flatly WTO inconsistent. And that it goes to the very core national treatment obligation of, of the gas. So you would really be throwing out the baby with a bathwater if you did that. Yeah, I, I guess the way, I guess one way around that, just for to be academic, David, I, well, first of all, from a realistic perspective, I agree with you. But I guess you could have a situation where you say, listen, we're having a reset. Um, we're going to reset the WTO schedules and that kind of thing. And we're going to have certain sectors that we just put on our schedules. Because even now, you know, people have, you know, countries have schedules at the WTO of, you know, you know service sectors where they're not going to make changes, uh, you know, certain tariff lines where they're not going to make changes. I mean, you, you could just, you know, have everyone say, listen, everyone is going to have 90% of your economy we're going to liberalize as much as we can, but everyone can account for 10% of your GDP and you're just going to do whatever you want, right? Because you think it's important, whether it's autos or, you know, semiconductors or ag or whatever it is. I mean, I, I would say by default, everyone has ag as like, as like their secret set apart. Um, but I mean, that, that's that's one way. If you were to get to a position where you wanted to reset and maybe you do it with a few countries, right? You select a few. I mean, that's what the gap was, right? It was, it was never... 190 people, it was, hey, let's have kind of a set of folks who are generally like-minded. Let's try to liberalize together. There's certainly a foreign policy aspect to this given the Cold War. Um, and then, you know, post-Cold War, it was like, hey, everything's fine. Everyone's going to become a market economy. I mean, in the same way people went into Iraq and Afghanistan thinking we're going to turn these places into democracies. We did the WTO, you know, bringing in China and Russia thinking we're going to make these people market, market oriented. We're going to make these governments market oriented. Um, and there's, you know, there's some na naivete to, to all that. But maybe there is a world where you can have a, you know, a smaller group of folks. And, and, and frankly, we have that to some degree with USMCA, you know, agreements with some of our allies. And maybe it's just not going to be big, fancy, flashy and broad, but maybe it'll be more sectoral and, and more targeted. So, you know, on to the next question on, on Q&A. Uh, someone asked about the national security WTO decisions, which I, I take to mean the national security exception jurisprudence. And, you know, I know recently, I believe last November, there was a case where the U.S. invoked the national security exception to the 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum and the WTO appellate body, well, no, the WTO dispute resolution panel, because there is no appellate body, said essentially that the national security exception did not apply here. I was wondering, could you guys maybe talk about the national security exception, the appellate body's jurisprudence in contrast to the U.S. interpretation of that clause of the treaty? Sure. Um, I, I mean, what, what's fundamental to the U.S. interpretation is that it is um, self-judging. OK, so, so it's not a question of what is national security? What is and, you know, what's, you know, 
how should how should dispute settlement panels decide what is and isn't appropriately national security? No, like the U.S. position is like before that. The U.S. position is this is not justiciable, right? This is this is self judging. A country knows what its own national security interests are, and so no dispute panel should even be able to pass judgment on this at all. That that's the U.S. position. Does that come with risks? Oh, for sure, it comes with risks, right? You can have you know. So someone, you know, you can have a bad actor say, well, this is all just national security. And frankly, that's probably the direction we're going, um, you know, but, but we also like, you know, we, we live in, um, you know, we, we like to think that we're beyond this like Hob- Hobbesian world, but I mean, we're, we're, we're in a world where political reality matters and power matters and geopolitics matter. And sometimes, you know, we create these norms to capture what everyone's already doing. There's certainly an aspirational level to them, but a lot of times people are going to agree to these if they're going to go against what they think are their core national interests, even if they aren't traditionally what might be national security interests. And the U.S. might be one of those as much as any other country. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. If you, if you look at um, U.S. FTAs, starting with, with the Singapore and Chile FTAs, you'll find that the, the assumption security exception in those agreements is much shorter. The, 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 the jurisprudence in the last couple of years under that, that exception turned on this language in, in Article 21 that talks about during time of war or other emergency and international relations. That, that text is, is not in uh, the, the FTA, uh, assumption security exceptions. And that goes back to, um, I, I was I was the lawyer for the Chile FTA, and and we were doing that FTA right after 9/11, and we got into a fight uh, with DOJ and Defense Department over that language, and and they wanted a more streamlined version that didn't have those those extra that extra verbiage, and they said we want to make sure that we have full uh, 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 you know freedom to do whatever we need, and we said well it's self judging you know you do have uh, full full freedom, and they say well what if the WTO says you know it's not self judging. And we said, well, that's, I mean, that's just, that's never happened. And, and everyone, everyone exercises restraint in, in asserting that, that, that uh, exception because, you know, no one wants to go down that road. That's mutually assured destruction, <laughs> you know. Um, and that held for, I mean, we lost that battle and the language went into the FTAs in a more limited way. Um, and then 20 years later, it got invoked, it got litigated. And once it got litigated and, and the, and the panels decided to go down that road. It was pretty clear where they they were going to end up, you know, using the kind of textual interpretation that that um, that they do. But but it's a shame because really those cases shouldn't have been brought in the first place because cases that go to these core issues of of what a country, as Jameson said, what a country sees it as its own essential security interest, they're going to stick to their guns no matter what the outcome is. And and so and so once you push the issue anyway and litigate it, knowing that the other country is not going to comply. You really started started to seed, you know, set the seeds for the destruction of the system, which which unfortunately is what seems to be happening. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is like this is like Exhibit A for people might like me who are pretty skeptical of the WTO system, but who are willing to like, hey, let's you know, f- fine to have this thing. Are there solutions? You know, we should try to work together with folks to make you know non-sensitive trade as as fluid as we can. But when you do something like this, I mean, it's like. It's like, what are you guys thinking? You're just stepping right in it. You know, I mean, the, the WTO, I know we're talking about the appellate body, but like, if you just take a, you know, a step back, I mean, one of the things they've done recently is there's been a big push largely by their secretary general too, to, to weaken intellectual property rules that are guaranteed by the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property um, to, to make it easier to waive uh, intellectual property protections, uh, you know, in the event of, you know, health emergencies, even though there are already lots of flexibilities for that. And so when you, when you look at the WTO, what have they done over the past couple of years? Well, they've weakened IP rules. Uh, they've told countries, you don't know what your own national security is. Uh, you know, I, I mean, none of that is really, you know, is a recipe for consensus. None of it is a recipe for convincing the United States that, you know what, we understand, you know, we need to, we need to stay in our lane. Like they're just doing the opposite, right? They're, they're weakening, they're weakening rules. And they're purporting to rule on things that are at the core of a country's national interest. Yeah, you know, Trevor, I should say this is slightly off topic of the specific question, but you know, I have a lot of, of U.S. clients uh, who who export both both in the goods and the services uh, sectors, especially in the services sectors. <clears throat> and we're really suffering right now from from the lack of of a functioning WTO uh, 
system because we've found, I found when I was at USTR, in a lot of countries, they find that an adverse WTO ruling makes it easier for them to do something they want to do anyway, but can't for their own political reasons domestically. And so we can't use uh, the WTO to address these issues. We're having trouble uh, getting USTR to, to take them on under Section 301. And so you're kind of in this position right now where, where these, these things are happening and there's not much we can do about it, which is really quite frustrating to, to me and to, and to my clients and to US exports. So ideally, I would like to see the system come back suitably, uh, uh, suitably reformed, but it's gonna be uh, quite difficult, as I said, and I don't know if that's gonna happen. Well, thank you. Um, oh, we just got a new question. All right. So Judge Vaden asked, he says, the USMCA established its own dispute resolution process that provided for final decisions on an expedited basis. To date, the process has most frequently been invoked for labor disputes involving individual Mexican manufacturing plants and disputes involving billions of dollars of American ag exports remain in limbo relating to corn or unenforced relating to dairy. Does the uneven use of USMCA enforcement procedures run the risk of discrediting all trust in multinational dispute resolution? I mean, I, I think I think there is some risk of that, right? I mean, we, we developed the dispute settlement system in USMCA with a few ideas in mind. One, we had a deal that had good rules for American farmers and workers and, and, and American interests. Therefore, we would want a strong dispute settlement system. Of course, dispute settlement rests in the discretion of the administration who gets to decide when they're going to enforce. You know, we can hear from Congress, and we do hear from Congress repeatedly on how they think USTR should be enforcing. And Congress is talking about it in a pretty broad-based way. They certainly support the labor enforcement, but you also hear them coming down strongly and saying you need to be you know, enforcing, whether it's the dairy that the judge refers to or all the, um, you know, the, the biotech trades in Mexico. Um, we have an energy case going on that got started, and now we're just like waiting, even though it's kind of a you know, slam dunk win for the United States. So I think, um, unfortunately, and again, maybe this is just cynical being in Washington, again, we're in a situation where I, I think sometimes political things um, can affect the way we do enforcement, right? Um, you know, the Democratic Party has a strong union base, and so they're enforcing these labor issues, which I agree with. I think we should do that. But that doesn't mean we should leave these other things uh, undone. Um, I, I, think, I think if you have a, a good agreement with strong enforcement across the board, then you can have support for trade and trade rules. But when you don't do that, then you kind of lose the folks who are thinking, well, I was willing to give this a try, or we're willing to do this. Oh, but now I see that the benefits of enforcement are accruing to some other group and not to me. I mean, that that's not a good situation, right? You, you wanna be able to, to show that, you know, here are agreements and here's enforcement that can benefit US interests wherever it might be. And I guess, you know, for a last question in the Q&A was, if given carte blanche to rework WTO rules or dispute settlement system, how would you address China's non-market economy factors? A big question to close us out on there. Jameson, why don't you go first? You were there for that. <laughs> well, we just created our own dispute settlement mechanism with China, so we did. Um, I mentioned earlier, there are certain things that the WTO just doesn't cover, right? Um, aspects of forced technology transfer, uh, overcapacity, excess capacity, um, you know, subsidies or, or, or dumping that affects, um, you know, affects our companies and third markets, places like things like that. Um, the whole idea of, of you know, military civil fusion, um, you know, directed, you know, strategic acquisition programs, um, all kinds of things. Some of these, some of these things have resolutions that are not trade oriented, right? And so maybe it's not exactly that you go to the WTO and say, hey, you know, let, let's deal with technology theft. I mean, you, you can, right? But I mean, we have other means too, right? We have export controls to, con to have some control on that. You know, we have our Department of Justice that can do investigations and indictments. I mean, all these things have limitations too. So if I, I mean, if I could redo some of this stuff, um, you know, I, I would actually start not so much at the WTO, I'd start more on our regional and bilateral trade agreements. One thing I wish we had done in USNCA, and now I regret, is, is that we had limited, that we had put a cap on the amount of content you could have 
from a non-market economy if you want to get duty-free treatment. So in other words, if you have to have 65% or 75% you know, North American content to get duty-free treatment under USMCA, that's great. But that still means you can have like 35% Chinese content, right? So they're benefiting from this. They potentially are benefiting from this agreement without having to live by any of the rules. Um, we get at that a little bit in the IRA. They have rules that are like that, that are pretty draconian, to be honest. But I mean, those, you know, that kind of thing. We also have in the USMCA a provision that says, if any of the parties to the agreement are going to do an FTA with China, we can kick you out, right? So you don't become just an, an, an export hub for China into one of the parties. Um, so I mean, those are the kinds of things that I would incorporate into our regional uh, and bilateral FTAs. I would just say again, as far as, as <clears throat> changing the WTO rules in a way that would address the issues we have with China, it's just going to be probably impossible because China wouldn't agree to make those changes. You know, I mean, I, th I think the problem that we've that we've ended up with with China is that there was some expectation back when we first brought them into WTO that they shared a certain viewpoint of how a government uh, uh, works in its economy and how it how it interacts with its companies and. And those assumptions just haven't borne out, uh, especially you know, once they started with like the Made in China 2025 program and that kind of thing. China has just gone in a, in a different direction. It's just, it's just not consistent with market-oriented views that you have in, in, in Western countries. And, and so trying to figure out a way to capture these practices when one government just doesn't adopt, doesn't accept the underlying premise you know, is probably going to be impossible. And, and, so, and so more likely that, that you see more, if we get back to negotiating market access, which the current administration isn't doing, but more agreements like USMCA being expanded to more countries and maybe a separate, a separate system that doesn't include China, that doesn't include Russia, uh, that, that liberalizes amongst those who are willing to do so. And, and maybe those who, who aren't uh, willing to do so, you're just gonna have what you have now with section 301 and other kinds of measures being used instead. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's an underlying assumptions, right? Sometimes you hear people say, well, let's just, you know, let's just kind of, you know, do this other big agreement and then China will feel pressure that they need to comply with that too. And that doesn't make any sense to me because they were already in the WTO and they didn't feel pressure to it. You know, the, the United States, when it comes to the WTO, it signs on thinking, I'm going to comply with these. And then if I'm found that I haven't followed it, I'm going to change my law, which is what happened repeatedly over and over in the Bush and Obama administration. That's not how China approaches it, just like David said. I mean, th their view is not, I'm going to join the WTO so I can conform myself to the system. Their view is, I'm going to join the WTO because I think it furthers my national interest as the People's Republic of China. And if it doesn't, if there's instances where it doesn't, then I'm going to do what I think, you know, uh, is best for the People's Republic of China. It, it's just a very different approach to it, right? I mean, obviously, we're guilty, too, of, you know, sometimes doing things that don't follow it and probably intentionally, Right. Um, but, you know, and, and that's part of why we're seeing the breakdown of the system. Well, thank you both so much for this. This has been great. Um, Jack is back and he's going to close us out. But I just want to thank again our two panelists. This was a great discussion. And thank you, everyone in the audience who decided to join us today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Well, thank you, Trevor. Uh, yes, and certainly on behalf of Federal Society, I do want to thank David and Jameson for their time today. As always, we welcome any listener feedback that you might have by email at info at fed-soc.org. Please keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming webinars. Uh, but with that, thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>